Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, aloha. And welcome to this afternoon's presentation. Our keynote speaker is Brigade General James B. Bar Bartholomews, Director of G3, U.S. Army Pacific Command. He previously commanded the 173rd Infantry Brigade Combat Team Airborne, the 2nd Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, as well as the 2nd Battalion, 35th Infantry Regiment, 25th Infantry Division in Hawaii. He deployed, in Iraq, uh, he deployed to Iraq with 3rd Ranger Battalion, deployed several times in support of Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, and has served in peacekeeping deployments to uh, Haiti and Baz Herz Hers e Govina. If you have any questions for the general, please text those to uh, please text those to the address located on the screens. Got the queue now. There it is. Right, left to my right and to my left. Now, please join me in a warm welcome for this afternoon's guest speaker, Brigade General James Bartholomew, Director, G3, U.S. Army Pacific Command. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. All right. It's great to see everyone uh, this afternoon. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction, and, uh, and thank you uh, to all, uh, AF uh, CEA um, uh, ladies. Thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to uh, address uh, this audience. Uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, General Flynn, uh, Charlie Flynn, who is the uh, Theater Army commander of, of the Indo-Pacific, and uh, I'm humbled to have this opportunity, my first opportunity with a TechNet conference. I've served uh, in this position for the past uh, two plus years, and for those I've uh, run across, there's few who've been the G3 of the Theater Army for that long. Normally, we kind of cycle in and out after a, a year, and, uh, and, and the Army's role in the Indo-Pacific is, is often uh, uh, not appreciated or understood, but I hope in my few minutes up here I can provide uh, his perspective on the theater, our operational requirements, and how, uh, how we operate as part of the Joint Force. Uh, we appreciate the, the fact that, that we get to talk to you, and, and I have the opportunity to talk to you about uh, how we mobilize data to dominance through partnership. We require a resilient and redundant joint network with online data to enable a persistent COP across Indo-PACOM and to operate in contested joint uh, environments. General Flynn often refers to the theater as this uh, most consequential theater at this most consequential time. And I know previous speakers, certainly Admiral Paparo preceding me, could do a much better job on describing uh, this theater, its vastness, its challenges for the five national security threats in this region, and, and all, the, all the maritime and air challenges we face, uh, it is unquestionable as this is the only uh, geographic combatant command that's named after two oceans. It is, uh, it is dominated in this sense, but as we look at this, we see two continents of Asia and Australia, the archipelago that stretches uh, through Southeast Asia. We see uh, two-thirds of the global's economy and seven of the world's largest militaries uh, with thousands upon thousands of Pacific islands that uh, are concerned all for their security and their sovereignty. The geostrategic weight of the world in this century is in this region, and I'm sure that was preceded, those who preceded me and those who will follow uh, talked about this, but it's not just because of the global commons, because, but it's because of the sovereignty of land that is under threat in this region. Across these nations, there is competition for resources, precious resources across South Asia, uh, to uh, those across Oceania, uh, to those within the first island chain. And it's our army and our network of allies and partners of which uh, two thirds, or really more like four fifths of the chiefs of defense are army officers, and most of those nations we work with defend their sovereignty with their armies. Those relationships, those nations that we work with, serves as a great counterweight to the malign activity uh, as, as we work through the challenges in this theater. 
as General Flynn likes to say, this is a joint theater with joint problems. Each of those problems require joint solutions. And the theater army is an integral part of the joint force. The focus of the national defense strategy is integrated deterrence, which as General Flynn, again, I'll channel his comments on this, simply put, as an infantryman would say, it equals no war. His equation is that integrated deterrence is the summation of capability, posture, messaging, and will. A key component of this capability and posture is our theater army's ability to communicate with the joint force alongside our allies and partners. And capability is achieved through interoperability, which is not only technical, but it's also procedural and human. And so we in the theater army are focused on all three of these components, realizing that uh, the focus of this conference is technical, but certainly procedural and human have a huge uh, part in this. I'll, I'll hit this as I go through. Our role as a theater army that we see uh, in this is in supporting the joint force uh, comes in three areas. That's in war fighting, campaigning, and war gaming. I'd like to share uh, these three focus areas with you and how each of these nests with our requirements and how uh, they can link to how you can help us uh, not only with industry but with the, uh, the joint communications uh, body at, at large and how technology enables us. The first is user pack is focused on war fighting. The Army uh, just last month published our new uh, field Manual 3.0, and for those who served in the Army, you know uh, that that is operations. And the, this publication is important because it just put into doctrine, Army doctrine, our operating concept of multi-domain operations. Multi-domain operations was, uh, as a concept, was born from this theater as we looked at how the Army land forces support the joint force in dealing with adversary uh, layers of defense that are growing and becoming more challenging. As we've learned and we look through history, any time we've gone air on air, sea on sea, land on land, uh, particularly across the, this theater with multiple historical vignettes during World War II, we have often fallen short. When we combine these capabilities and we put them together now with space and cyber, we can harness uh, the, and actualize what multi-domain operation as our doctrine now allows us to do. With this, in war fighting, in operationalizing our concept, we, we really focus on tough, realistic training that every field training exercise and every command post exercise with a large-scale global com uh, combat operation scenario allows us to build. This builds readiness, which has been a, a hallmark for the, the Army over time, but the echelons and the way that we do that are no longer focused on the brigade combat team as the last two decades have focused is in uh, the, the, the many battles that many of us have, have uh, fought throughout uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. In this new fight with these new echelons, the concepts and our doctrine pull us to focus on theater enabling assets at the theater army that support the joint force, the core level, the core echelon, and the division echelon and that they're all enabled by tactical actions at the brigade level and below. That, it, that really focuses how we war fight, how we fight and train, and how we integrate with the joint force. The two mechanisms that we do in the theater army, the things that we do to operationalize this are, are through two primary mechanisms. One of those command post exercises. We participated in a number of those command post exercises under Indo-PACOM, and we've matured the capability that can support them. One of those signature formations that does this is the multi-domain task force, which we stood up at Joint Base lewis McCord, the very first one in 2019. Uh, it is uh, forming headquarters with intelligence, electronic warfare, uh, signal capability, space cyber integrated with long range uh, precision fires that are deliver being delivered in time in support of the joint force. The first was stood up almost three years ago the second was stood up in Europe and is, is uh, working against and managing the challenges associated with the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And just within the last two months, we've stood up third multi-domain task force here in Oahu. And so as we stand up these capabilities, we in the, integrate them into these exercises. 
Our most recent Army exercise that we've made joint is for those who are Army officers uh, have heard of warfighters. This is a Army Division and Corps command post exercise that typically uh, ends at the core level in training. But our armies recognize, in accordance with our doctrine, we have to connect them to theaters, theater armies, and joint forces to make them relevant, to actualize our multi-domain operations. If they're not joint, it's not relevant. And so our most recent warfighter we executed, uh, First Corps, America's First Corps, was the training audience. The theater army served as a high comm, as a combined joint task force. We pulled in uh, plugs from the GIFMIC, uh, represented by Third Fleet, from uh, special operations, from Air Force elements, uh, across the board in order to rehearse a, a, and train against a Pacific scenario uh, for the very first time that was not a Korea uh, scenario. It allowed us to train in our archipelago environment, to train concepts of, of uh, forcible entry operations by air and sea. It tested uh, our logistics. It integrated our, our fifth, special for, our fifth uh, Security Force Assistance Brigade. And it allowed us to learn iteratively through a command post exercise and inform the joint force. The second way that we're doing this is in our war fighting capability and training our war fighting is through our Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Center, JPMRC, which is uh, our combat training center to train our brigades, but in accordance with our doctrine to train echelons at the division level as well as integrate with the joint force and allies and partners. So today is day three of a 10 day field training exercise across the Hawaiian Islands uh, from Pakaloa training area in, uh, in the Big Island uh, to here in Oahu, as well as uh, the, uh, the Pacific Missile uh, Test Range out in Kauai, and then distributed uh, constructively across other islands so that we can not only train and validate uh, at a large-scale global exercise uh, level, uh, 2nd Brigade 25th Infantry Division, but have the 25th Infantry Division as a whole, as well as their enabling commands and our theater enabling commands, help participate in this uh, cross-island exercise. We've integrated uh, the Marines. You'll hear from General Clearfield tomorrow. They've recently stood up the 3rd uh, Marine Littoral Regiment that regiment, 3rd MLR, is participating in this exercise as part of the joint force and they're working through their uh, expeditionary advance basing operation concept. We have 15th Air Wing out of Hickam that is executing their operational concept of agile combat employment. We have, uh, we have SOF that are integrated with all uh, out of 1st Special Forces Group with SOC PAC elements participating. And then we have uh, pack fleet uh, supporting as well. And so with this, we pulled in three additional nations that are providing uh, forces on ground and then nine nations are observing. And so that's the reason why you get me today because General Flynn is out with some of those key uh, allies and partners on the ground uh, walking through the field training exercise and showing them uh, how not only this is a place we can train for, it trains us in theater, it keeps our forces in theater, so they're not going back to Fort Polk or Fort Irwin, uh, which puts us out of theater for months on end and our equipment months on end, but it generates readiness in order to prepare to propel us forward. We're using this as an op opportunity to test our command post, to stress our joint fires networks with all the players that I mentioned, all while refining our joint target quality cop and the ability to pass and pull data from a common fabric. As as the operations officer at USERPAC, General Flynn has charged us that every exercise we execute has an experiment or more, and every experiment is in an exercise. And so this begins in our war fighting, but it goes on to my second point, which is campaigning. Second, we campaign. The purpose of campaigning in accordance with our national defense strategy is in order to get forces forward to rehearse, conduct reconnaissance, to build relationships and build strategic and operational joint readiness. And our mechanism to do this is through Operation Pathways. Many of you may have, may have heard who served in here of Pacific Pathways, which started in roughly 2014. The idea was to stitch together three to four exercises so that a brigade would go into the theater and it would move between exercises. 
Uh, there was a cost-cutting mechanism to this and using transportation. It put forces forward. But we've taken that and we've operationalized it, no longer simply Pacific Pathways, but Operation Pathways as an operational concept put, to put operational forces forward. In much the same concept, first multi-domain task force deployed into the first island chain for the very first time uh, this past year under uh, uh, Pathways, and we hope to keep them forward and iterate and training. It strengthens op interoperability as we're working with our allies and partners in, these, uh, in key terrain and in key exercises. The exercise remain the vehicle, but the opportunity to train and bring in joint combined training is absolutely in, in concert with and, and the requirement of Admiral Aquilina, our combatant commander. More forces forward more often. And finally, the focus is denying key terrain, physical, human, and information dimensions to our adversaries as we're forward. It gives us the opportunity to see, sense, and understand as we build our sensor network forward, this is through sensors that are manned, but also over time unmanned capability. We have staying power forward now through our fifth Security Forces Assistance Brigade on the ground forward continuously for the past 20 months at this point, going on two years in key, um, in key countries where they're helping advise. So when training forces leave, they're still on the ground and training at the desire and the request of those chiefs of army and chiefs of defense. And we're ultimately rehearsing how to deliver the right effects to the right targets to support the joint forces freedom of action. This, this is a level of maturing of our exercise and campaigning as we set the theater uh, forward uh, and we're using pathways to do just that. Within it, we want to re rehearse how we uh, execute distributed operations. First Corps spoke of this on our panel yesterday as they are our operational core forward. America's First Corps is, is leading the charge in this and looking at how to distribute mission command and experiment with joint solutions. We need to use operation pathways to modernize our processes, systems, and application of hybrid cloud-enabled uh, capability at the point of need to deliver the joint force on a transport ag agnostic and scalable manner. A distributed cap capability must enable data exchange on multiple networks. We acknowledge that uh, there, uh, there's a need to be able to communicate with our allies and partners, and we're iteratively working through this with each one of them based upon our capabilities. Having served in the 173rd Airborne uh, in, in Europe in my previous assignment, and having worked as part of Alliance, uh, there, there are certainly some, some ease and benefits in doing these things and networks that allow us to do this. We don't have those advantages in this theater, and so we have to maximize every opportunity and look for creative solutions in order to be able to share the right data at the right time with the right partners and allies for the right solutions. And so this is, this is something that we have to consider as we're working through uh, each, of our, each of our challenges. I have some experts in the crowd I can point to if you have specific questions, and we're, we're working through uh, through the mission data uh, platform that Indopaycom hosts, as well as uh, using cross-domain solution capabilities uh, in experimentation. Finally, we have, to, we have to understand how we're doing what we're doing makes sense. And that's where, for those of other servicers who are looking at this Army guy talking about this theater and thinking, how, how, how are you even thinking you're relevant here? This is an air and maritime theater. The way we do this is through wargaming. And we do it through joint wargaming. And that's my third point that I'll say of, of warfighting, campaigning, and wargaming. We use this to identify our gaps while testing and validating our assumptions. We participate regularly in the Navy's global war game, which is a Department of the Navy sponsored war game that occurs at the National uh, or at the Naval War College uh, at least every two years and sometimes uh, in smaller numbers. I think we're on global 16. So I participated in global 14. General Flynn's participated in at least four globals over time. The Army's in force at these, uh, these war games because ultimately, while there are Navy war games and Admiral Paparo is at the lead, they're ultimately in support of Indo-PACOM and therefore we as a joint force uh, need to be present and part of it. What General Flynn decided after Global 14 is that we needed to stand up our own war game, a joint war game to complement this and sponsor by our, our Army's uh, Center for Army Analysis, CAA. They have conducted war games in support of Indo-PACOM, uh, very familiar with joint capabilities and have uh, done this iteratively over years. And so we stood up 
our, our unified Pacific War game starting this past late fall, stretching into a culminating war game in uh, April and then into May. It was a joint war game with joint planners, many of the same uh, planners that participated in, in, uh, in Global and continue to participate in Global so that we have, are on a joint campaign of learning. Much of the same data was shared and ultimately we want to use this opportunity to continue to iterate on how we, uh, how we learn through processes, incorporating uh, red teams from across the services as well as within the Secretary of Defense's office and uh, pulling in ideas and concepts from across our centers of excellence within each of the branches of service. Our wargaming is informing our data and network requirements for a joint target quality COP and integrated SIP across multiple classification networks in order to increase real-time OSINT, which is becoming increasingly important in this operating environment, enterprise level identi uh, identity credential and access management, service agnostic transport infrastructure, and a data fabric that enables commander decision making at the speed of relevance. Entering into 23, we're gonna focus our war games uh, uh, specific uh, uh, joint functions that will uh, enable the joint force to uh, more hone into those things. And with the Army as the lead uh, in the, for joint uh, contested logistics, sustainment is a key concern of ours right now as we, we uh, see it as our role to help sustain the joint force. Wargaming informs how we fight, how we build readiness, and ultimately how we campaign through operation pathways. Two points in closing I'll provide from feedback from uh, some of the wise uh, warrant officers that, that I get to work with and that I've, that I've heard from uh, over time. And, and uh, I hope this will resonate with this crowd because I realize we have a wide swath of, uh, of industry, of military uh, serving currently across multiple commands and uh, all are hoping, hoping to help. And so from the panel, I sort of came away with two conclusions. One was um, we, the collective we, we need your help disciplining us in the use of the systems we have right now and maximizing those so that we can harness what is there as opposed to jumping to a new tool before we know how to utilize what we have. And the ones that we have that you have some level of ownership, having the understanding and the creativity to help us dev this. Businesses and corporations uh, figure out how to do this very well and you all do it very well. But within the military and our programs of record, we have to train that agility and, and we need your help with the agility to, to maximize the use of what we have. Because as we get to, the, to my level and I get asked often about operational requirements, uh, I've given you a couple of them at a level that I'm comfortable providing. But ultimately it's, it's the capabilities that we have right now, how do we get them to work for us so we can focus on war fighting campaigning within a realistic war game? Number one. Number two, we need the communications enterprise to enter into the operations world. I will come into your world and I will attempt to try to understand, but I need the communications team to do more than just ask for requirements and fold their arms. Tell me what your requirements are. If I could, you know, a nickel for every time I've heard that, I will tell you that uh, I'd be a rich man. And we need your help whether you're industry, whether you're uh, military, whether you're connected in some way, is to attempt to try and understand within the level that you have access to, to work to solve these problems because this is largely a military talent management problem. Uh, my, my esteemed warrant officer provided this as a good point because this is very important. Talent management of the people that we send in. I'm encouraged by the STEM and, and the young military, the youth that want to come in, we need that vibrant curiosity to come in and, and, to, and to hone that. Uh, but ultimately, it cannot get stovepiped into our bureaucracies of our commands that don't think that their problem is to solve operation problems because it's all of our problems. So I'll close with General Flynn's comments again. He gives us two pieces of, of advice every day. And... Um, and and this resonates with me because I hear it often uh, as his operations officer. We need to get organized and we need a sense of urgency. And so those are the two things that our command is working towards in support of Indo-PACOM and support of the joint force. This is a joint problem. Uh, we don't do anything in our theater army without the joint force. 
We don't do anything without some level of interagency involved. We don't do anything without an ally and partner involved because we're on the land and we're face to face with our allies and partners. And ultimately we're getting to the point where we're not doing anything unless we're thinking about a multi-domain environment. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for your service to our nation, whether it be in industry or military or wherever you are. And I look forward uh, to taking your questions. Thank you, sir. We do have some questions from the audience. Want to remind everybody that the email uh, to, at, to submit your questions is askmeindopac at gmail.com. Our first question from the audience for you today. What lessons might China be learning from the Russo-Ukrainian war that give them pause about invading Taiwan and which U.S. Army Pacific might be able to exploit? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll just preface this with saying that um, I'll start where I, where I will let, let off and kind of finish, is that the relationships with our allies and partners are, are, are incredibly important. And there's a level of honesty that we have to have with them and they with us that builds trust. Trust is important action, attribute of those three of the human um, level of interoperability. And so um, part of that trust and what we've learned is that everyone is watching what is happening in Ukraine today. Everyone is watching. So yes, our, our uh, pacing challenge is watching and learning. Difficult to say what they're, and, and, and I could speculate what I think they're learning, and I, I won't go too far there because I think that this is, that's, that's, that'd be a lot of speculation on our parts. But what I can tell you with confidence that our Army partners are learning in this AO. Our, um, our uh, allies and partners that we work with every day, and a lot of this is coming from our 5th Security Forces Assistance Brigade, because they're persistently with them all the time, integrated in talking to Chiefs of Army. Uh, we have captains and majors that are talking to Chiefs of Army. The vast majority are incredibly concerned about defending the sovereignty of their nations and are willing to s discuss that with us in an open forum that they might not other otherwise have been. And that's a different conversation that we were having before the invasion uh, in February, January. Those conversations were not as open and honest. And so we, as a theater army, are working alongside in a reassuring manner to talk to them about how we help them and support the defense of their nations, their, defending their sovereignty. So um, I can tell you with confidence that that, that these, these nations that we work alongside with that invite us in to uh, train with them and to work with them, they are working towards and they are training their military forces to, to defend their sovereignty. Because as like-minded nations that enjoy uh, the benefits of globalization, that enjoy the benefits of the global commons, but ultimately defend their shores and their sovereignty, this is, this is forefront in their mind and it is driving the way they think and it is driving the way they advise their political advisors. That's driving the way they think about the region. And that is why the theater army's role is so important. Land forces, which include army, marine forces, special operations forces, and allies and partners. Those land forces collaborating, we have to collaborate together to help them come up with the land solutions in a joint fight. Now in terms of uh, what we hope they might be learning is that um, sovereign nations will defend their territory when threatened. That's what we're hoping they're learning. I, whether, and that's, that, that's, uh, that'd be speculation. But this is, this is the lesson that, that we all should learn. And we as, as a free people and in this American experiment, as, as, I, as many of us here in this room have sworn to defend the Constitution of the United States, not to a king, not to a ruler, but to an idea that all men are created equal, all men, women created equal. This, this, is, this dream, this experiment is, is alive and well in the discussions that we're having with our partners because it's becoming more real as, as seen in, in, uh, in Europe. And so that connection of armies is something that, that uh, hopefully uh, resonates with the uh, person who asked the question. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Next question from the audience. What lessons are we learning from the Army's support in Europe, leveraging information dominance and data, to now scale and extend new technologies in the Indo-PACOM area of responsibility? Yeah, so we, we've been studying this uh, heavily with uh, U.S. Army Africa. We sent teams over uh, to look at the, uh, the, uh, the headquarters that are, that are operating over there. And um, some of the key things that have come uh, to pass are one of the things that you, you may have heard as a soundbite that, that uh, I provided in terms of uh, a war gaming requirement, which is, uh, is how do we mesh and understand the information environment, which is largely uh, open source information with the other classifications of data so we understand and, and, and can build an intelligence network that is based upon all those, all those capabilities coming together. And so that's, that's an immediate one for the intelligence community to wrap their ar arms around. I know that at the Department of Defense level and down, everyone, everyone is uh, working to tackle this, but it's certainly something that from an innovation standpoint we have to work. And then uh, from a trust environment, we have to, we have to uh, work through. The other thing is, is how do we use that same medium to assess um, effects? So it's, it's not enough to just understand the environment, it's to understand how we are interacting in the environment. And so our army is uh, shifting as part of, uh, I mentioned multi-domain operations as doctrine. The, army, the United States Army is going to uh, a, an information advantage focus, which is uh, similar to information operations, but a much larger scale, which incorporates elements of multi-domain operations because of the need for information management. So uh, I think that falls in line with the theme for this com conference, which is interesting, of data to dominance through partnership. The idea of, of, uh, of uh, that, that decision dominance, it resonates within the joint force, albeit our terminology for information operations is a little different. But the assessment tools largely within, uh, within uh, open source are key to this uh, problem set. Thank you, sir. Are you able to add cyber defense and cyber offensive operations to training requirements for this joint theater? How can industry help? Absolutely, it is being uh, added uh, now. Uh, actually, the, the formations that do it regularly in the defensive are obviously our, our, uh, our, our signal uh, organizations. So uh, the 311 signal command is our theater uh, signal command that enables uh, Army networks and supports the joint force for ne network backbone. And so they have, a, they have an Army role, but they have also have a joint role in uh, supporting this. So from a cyber defense standpoint, they are instrumental with uh, Army Cyber. Actually, uh, Army Cyber uh, provides uh, support to the joint force across uh, multiple combatant commands, and they, uh, we work uh, through uh, the Indo-PACOM and, and Fleet Cyber. In terms of offensive, there are, uh, we, we are training this with our multi-domain task forces because, as I mentioned, they have a host of electronic information, uh, EW, uh, space, and cyber capabilities within them. And so we are all about creative solutions on how to train and, uh, and, and hone the skills for offense as, uh, as well as defense. Thank you, sir. The next question. What interoperability challenges have your exercises uncovered related to the Army's joint sustainment role? Yeah, this is a, this is a good question. I'm not a sustainer, but I, I just, as watching these, uh, our, our wargaming in particular, as I mentioned, is sort of highlighting uh, these challenges because uh, we do admittedly have service stovepipes uh, that in, in sustainment because each of our services have their uh, means of, uh, of funding. However, the, where we come together as a joint force is through the joint commands and agencies that enable us, Transcom, DLA. Uh, they're, they're these, these agencies and commands that are ultimately joint that link in with uh, the Indo-PACOM Indo uh, J4 are, are instrumental. Our theater army, when we're talking about theater enabling commands, has our theater, 8th Theater Sustainment Command, uh, commanded by Major General uh, Jared Helwig. He is, is charged, uh, because we have the lead uh, in, the, in the joint warfighting concept that the Army does for joint contested logistics, he has in, in turn taken uh, on a, a role 
to partner with the services on how we enable joint sustainment through the Indo-PACOM J4. And so I think uh, this, this is in terms of uh, uh, port opening, in terms of uh, setting the theater, in terms of uh, movement with joint capability and maximizing uh, joint capability movement, we are working through this specific challenge through Operation Pathways, which, albeit an Army uh, operational operational focus, not just putting things on a ship or a plane and getting it to an exercise and turn around and bringing it back, but how are we working as a joint force to use these as rehearsals and utilizing Transcom, DLA, and others for common log user logistics and, and other facets to pull this all together and bring forward. There's an element of an experimentation, experimentation to this, as uh, we have uh, requirements uh, as a joint force to conduct joint logistics over the shore, particularly in this theater. Uh, this is something that we need to train, and it's uh, for us as an Army, it is uh, cross-component. So it's not just active duty forces, it's reserve forces and National Guard that we mobilize towards a mission, pull together in a joint force, and put it into exercise. So my, my way to cap off this question is, is the way in operations officer focuses this is, it, is in an exercise, is you force everyone to come to the table towards a mission and execute it. Because if you don't do it in an exercise and it's required at a time of need, you're doing it in combat. So take your pick. Which would you rather do? Rehearse in an exercise or do it in a crisis when you're not ready? And this is one that, that we are pushing as a theater army in particular that we rehearse and we train as we will fight. Thank you, sir. Next question. Recent North Korean missile launches have brought an uptick in tensions in the region, to the extent that you can discuss it here. How are we addressing this escalation? Um, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think the key thing that, that, that we are doing, and this is speaking for the theater army, is, is we're, we're binding closer with our, with our key allies and partners that are influenced with this problem. And so uh, our eighth uh, uh, field army, the only field army uh, in, in the United States Army, commanded by Lieutenant General Burleson, is in Korea, falls under uh, US forces uh, Korea. And so on Penn, uh, where, we have, where we host uh, tens of thousands of soldiers, combat capability, uh, they, they are working in support of the joint force to do this, but they're also uh, partnered with um, the, the uh, ROC forces in, in, uh, in looking at this challenge. And I think that um, the key thing with this is, is obviously at this point not just affecting those who are on Penn, but, but allies and partners who are off Penn and bringing us together as, as uh, like-minded nations and militaries to determine how we're going to, uh, to message against this challenge and, and really ensure that we're, we're ready uh, to respond. Uh, I think that it, it's, it, it's important that we appreciate, I mentioned four out of the five uh, threats are in this region. That's, that's another one that is significant, it's real, and we have to be ready to contest. Thank you, sir. We have time for one more question. How do emerging regional state military capabilities factor into expanding coalition strategies, Indonesia and Vietnam, for example? So regional state being those, those uh, nations are the, are the states we're talking about? The... Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, so great point. I, I, we, we are excited uh, to see uh, nations uh, work with one another. As a matter of fact, back to the trust and the connections that we make, many of the questions that we have uh, for uh, the, the armies that we speak with and we work with are, are where, where are their interests? Where do they have challenges? Because albeit the U.S. is, is certainly a, a, a global leader in many respects, um, again, going back to Europe, uh, the U.S. is um, um, uh, participation and, and integration to that alliance is, uh, of NATO is, is absolutely essential. Uh, it, it is leaned upon significantly. Not having an alliance here, having multiple bilateral alliances and other partnerships, and those are two uh, great examples, we, uh, we in the theater army 
encourage understanding where those uh, interests are with those armies, where they're partnering and working together, because the solution in some nations may not be necessarily uh, a, a U.S. solution. And quite frankly, we don't want it to be, because that is, uh, that is the cost calculus that we bring as a nation is of like-minded individuals that are, that are uh, and, and nations that are dependent upon this global commons and, and uh, what we've placed together. So those interactions that are, are built are in many ways appreciated and healthy and uh, in, in many respects um, are, are difficult for our adversaries to develop. And so we, uh, we appreciate those. We appreciate um, leaning on those. I'll give, a, I'll give an example I think that might just help bring this to, to light. And that's um, our relationship with the islands of, of the Blue Pacific, the Pacific Island nations. For those who live in, in, uh, in Hawaii and those who understand uh, island culture, uh, there's a number of uh, nation states that are populated here uh, by, um, other, um, by other nations across, across this region. And so uh, what binds uh, those nations together and how they uh, work together isn't necessarily always through a U.S. solution. Australia, New Zealand have great relationships with some nations that we work to look to partner with, but we have to work together in order to, to help uh, enable and bolster some of these nations that might otherwise be uh, susceptible to, uh, to some uh, na national challenges and coercion. And so it's really important that we work together uh, as a whole and, and not necessarily just look for the U.S. solution in every, in every bit, but we uh, maintain that network of allies and partners in all we do. Thank you, sir. That was our final question. Please welcome to the stage Jeff Bloom, past president, AFSIA Hawaii. Thank you very much, uh, General Bartholomew. Uh, there are a number of things that you mentioned today that we've heard over time, especially being in this AOR from AFSIA Hawaii and with AFSIA National. I know we did a TechNet Indo-Pacific in April, for those of you here, did, hadn't done one since 2019 before that. But a number of the points that you made are things we're hearing and we're hearing much more often now. Uh, not only the integrated deterrence, multi-domain operations, multi-domain task force, um, some of the unified network operations that the Army is doing, and we've heard those both in Augusta and in Baltimore, TechNet Cyber and here, but also more about joint combined training, joint fires network, the joint campaign of learning and experimentation, really important pieces. But the other pieces are the interoperability, not just across our services in joint, but with our mission partners in this AOR. If many of you that are here may remember in 2019, underneath Brigadier General Fredenberg's guise as the J6, we did something during TechNet called Coalition Interoperability Forum. It's being discussed again, will be brought back up, and we will do it not just once a year, but multiple times a year to bring our industry partners, our academic partners, our military partners, our government partners together in an open forum to create a community of interest to have these discussions and not just once a year. So again, thank you for the thoughts. I know we've talked a lot about this offline with a lot of us, but we need to do it more often in these environments where you can have these conversations, like you said, so that we all can talk and move the mission forward faster. Because again, open and honest conversations with our mission partners are critical, but it's also moving the technology forward to do these things. Because again, how are we gonna get the decision making at the speed of relevance to our commanders and our decision makers? So with that, I would like to thank you. Uh, AFSIA International and AFSIA Hawaii will be making a donation in lieu of a gift in your name to the friends of the Windward Wounded Warriors. But I would also like to share with you this AFSIA um, TechNet Indo-Pacific Challenge coin, very coveted, as General Fredenberg likes to say to you, as a thank you for our uh, appreciation for coming out today and representing General Flynn and U.S. Army Pacific. So with that, I say mahalo.
Thank you, General, for the excellent, uh, excellent presentation. Now, before we conclude, I, I would like to put out a, a couple of few admin remarks. So again, uh, please refer to the AFCEA TechNet uh, Indo-Pacific app for this afternoon's event, which includes a presentation at 1400 from Rear Admiral Thomas Hendership, Intelligence Directorate, J2 U.S. Indo-Pacom, uh, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Another note, be sure to visit the STEM Innovation Room, supported by the Dell Technologies, where you will find many of our future industry leaders, engineers, and, sci and scientists showing off their technology creation. Again, thank you. Thank you for your time and consideration here. This concludes our event.